Chapter Four of A Popular History of Ireland, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Ireland from the Earliest Period to the Emancipation of the Catholics, Book One by Thomas Darcy McGee. Chapter Four The Constitution and How the Kings Kept It. We have fortunately still existing the main provisions of that constitution which was prepared under the auspices of St. Patrick, and which, though not immediately nor simultaneously, was in the end accepted by all Erin as its supreme law. It is contained in a volume called The Book of Rights, and in its printed form, the Dublin Bilingual Edition of 1847, fills some 250 octavo pages. This book may be said to contain the original institutes of Erin under her Celtic kings. The Brehon Laws, which have likewise been published, bear the same relation to the Book of Rights as the statutes at large of England or the United States bear to the English Constitution in the one case, or to the collective federal and state constitutions in the other. Let us endeavour to comprehend what this ancient Irish constitution was like, and how the kings received it at first. There were, as we saw in the first chapter, beside the existing four provinces, whose names are familiar to every one, a fifth principality of Meath. Each of the provinces was subdivided into chieftainries, of which there were at least double or treble as many as there are now counties. The connection between the chief and his prince, or the prince and his monarch, was not of the nature of feudal obedience, for the fee simple of the soil was never supposed to be vested in the sovereign, nor was the king considered to be the fountain of all honour. The Irish system blended the aristocratic and democratic elements more largely than the monarchical. Everything proceeded by election, but all the candidates should be of noble blood. The chiefs, princes, and monarchs so selected were bound together by certain customs and tributes, originally invented by the genius of the Druids, and afterwards adopted and enforced by the authority of the bishops. The tributes were paid in kind, and consisted of cattle, horses, foreign-born slaves, hounds, oxen, scarlet mantles, coats of mail, chess-boards and chess-men, drinking-cups, and other portable articles of value. The quantity in every case due from a king to his subordinate, or from a subordinate to his king, for the gifts and grants were often reciprocal, is precisely stated in every instance. Besides these rights, this constitution defines the prerogatives of the five kings on their journeys through each other's territory, their accession to power, or when present in the general assemblies of the kingdom. It contains besides a very numerous array of prohibitions, acts which neither the Ard Ri nor any other potentate may lawfully do. Most of these have reference to old local pagan ceremonies, in which the kings once bore a leading part, but which were now strictly prohibited. Others are of interprovincial significance, and others again are rules of personal conduct. Among the prohibitions of the monarch, the first is that the sun must never rise on him in his bed at Tara. Among his prerogatives, he was entitled to banquet on the 1st of August, on the fish of the Boyne, fruit from the Isle of Man, cresses from the Brosna River, venison from Nars, and to drink the water of the well of Tala. In other words, he was entitled to eat on that day of the produce, whether of earth or water, of the remotest bounds, as well as of the very heart of his mensal domain. The King of Leinster was prohibited from upholding the pagan ceremonies within his province, or to encamp for more than a week in certain districts, but he was privileged to feast on the fruits of Almine, to drink the ale of Cullen, and to preside over the games of Carmen, Wexford. His colleague of Munster was prohibited from encamping a whole week at Killarney or on the Sur, and from mustering a martial host on the Leinster border at Gowran. He was privileged to pass the six weeks of Lent at Cashel, 
in free quarters, to use fire and force in compelling tribute from North Leinster, and to obtain a supply of cattle from Connaught, at the time of the singing of the cuckoo. The Connaught king had five other singular prohibitions imposed on him, evidently with reference to some old pagan rites, and his prerogatives were hostages from Galway, the monopoly of the chase in Mayo, free quarters in Murisk in the same neighbourhood, and to marshal his border host at Athlone to confer with the tribes of Meath. The ruler of Ulster was also forbidden to indulge in such superstitious practices as observing omens of birds, or drinking of a certain fountain between two darknesses. His prerogatives were presiding at the games of Cooley, with the assembly of the fleet, the right of mustering his border army in the plains of Louth, free quarters in Armagh for three nights for his troops before setting out on an expedition, and to confine his hostages in Dunseverick, a strong fortress near the giant's causeway. Such were the principal checks imposed upon the individual caprice of monarchs and princes. The plain inference from all which is that under the constitution of Patrick, a prince who clung to any remnant of ancient paganism, might lawfully be refused those rents and dues which alone supported his dignity. In other words, disguised as it may be to us under ancient forms, the Book of Rites established Christianity as the law of the land. All national usages and customs, not conflicting with this supreme law, were recognised and sanctioned by it. The internal revenues in each particular province were modelled upon the same general principle, with one memorable exception, the special tribute which Leinster paid to Munster, and which was the cause of more bloodshed than all other sources of domestic quarrel combined. The origin of this tax is surrounded with fable, but it appears to have arisen out of the reaction which took place when Tuahal, the legitimate, was restored to the throne of his ancestors, after the successful revolt of the Belgic bondsmen. Leinster seems to have clung longest to the Belgic revolution, and to have submitted only after repeated defeats. Tuahal, therefore, imposed on that province this heavy and degrading tax, compelling its princes not only to render him and his successors immense herds of cattle, but also a hundred and fifty male and female slaves, to do the menial offices about the palace of Tara. With a refinement of policy, as far-seeing as it was cruel, the proceeds of the tax were to be divided one-third to Ulster, one-third to Connaught, and the remainder between the Queen of the Monarch and the ruler of Munster. In this way all the other provinces became interested in enforcing this invidious and oppressive enactment upon Leinster, which, of course, was withheld whenever it could be refused, with the smallest probability of success. Its resistance and enforcement, especially by the kings of Munster, will be found a constant cause of civil war, even in Christian times. The sceptre of Ireland, from her conversion to the time of Brian, was almost solely in the hands of the northern High Nile, the same family as the O'Neills. All the kings of the 6th and 7th centuries were of that line. In the 8th century, from 709 to 742, the southern analysts style Cahal, king of Munster, Ard Ri. In the ninth century, 840 to 847, they give the same high title to Felim, king of Munster. And in the eleventh century, Brian possessed that dignity for the twelve last years of his life, 1002 to 1014. With these exceptions, the northern High Nile and their co-relatives of Meath, called the southern High Nile, seem to have retained the sceptre exclusively in their own hands during the five first Christian centuries. Yet on every occasion the ancient forms of election, or procuring the adhesion of the princes, had to be gone through. Perfect unanimity, however, was not required. A majority equal to two-thirds seems to have sufficed. If the candidate had the north in his favour, and one province of the south, he was considered entitled to take possession of Tara. If he were a southern, he should be seconded either by Connaught or Ulster, before he could lawfully possess himself of the supreme power. The benediction of the Archbishop of Armagh 
seems to have been necessary to confirm the choice of the provincials. The monarchs, like the petty kings, were crowned, or made, on the summit of some lofty mound prepared for that purpose. A hereditary officer, appointed to that duty, presented him with a white wand perfectly straight, as an emblem of the purity and uprightness which should guide all his decisions, and, clothed with his royal robes, the new ruler descended among his people, and solemnly swore to protect their rights, and to administer equal justice to all. This was the civil ceremony. The solemn blessing took place in a church, and is supposed to be the oldest form of coronation service observed anywhere in Christendom. A ceremonial not without dignity regulated the gradations of honour in the general assemblies of Erin. The time of meeting was the great pagan feast of Sawin, the first of November. A feast of three days opened and closed the assembly, and during its sittings crimes of violence committed on those in attendance were punished with instant death. The monarch himself had no power to pardon any violator of this established law. The chiefs of territories sat each in an appointed seat under his own shield, the seats being arranged by order of the olive or recorder whose duty it was to preserve the muster-roll containing the names of all the living nobles. The champions, or leaders of military bands, occupied a secondary position, each sitting under his own shield. Females and spectators of an inferior rank were excluded. The Christian clergy naturally stepped into the empty places of the Druids, and were placed immediately next the monarch. We shall now briefly notice the principal acts of the first Christian kings during the century immediately succeeding St. Patrick's death. Of Oliol, who succeeded Leary, we cannot say with certainty that he was a Christian. His successor, Louis, son of Leary, we are expressly told was killed by lightning, A.D. 496, for having violated the law of Patrick that is, probably, for having practised some of those pagan rites forbidden to the monarchs by the revised constitution. His successor, Murkatach, son of Era, was a professed Christian, though a bad one, since he died by the vengeance of a concubine named Sheen, that is, Storm, whom he had once put away at the instance of his spiritual adviser, but whom he had not the courage, though brave as a lion in battle, to keep away. A.D. 527. Tuahal, the rough, succeeded and reigned for seven years, when he was assassinated by the tutor of Dermid, son of Kerbal, a rival whom he had driven into exile. Dermid immediately seized on the throne, A.D. 534, and for twenty eventful years bore sway over all Erin. He appears to have had quite as much of the old leaven of paganism in his composition, at least in his youth and prime, as either Louis or Leary. He kept druids about his person, despised the right of sanctuary claimed by the Christian clergy, and observed with all the ancient superstitious ceremonial the national games at Taltin. In his reign the most remarkable event was the public curse pronounced on Tara by a saint whose sanctuary the reckless monarch had violated, in dragging a prisoner from the very horns of the altar, and putting him to death. For this offence, the crowning act of a series of aggressions on the immunities claimed by the clergy, the saint, whose name was Ruadan, and the site of whose sanctuary is still known as Temple Ruadan in Tipperary, proceeded to Tara, accompanied by his clergy, and walking round the royal wrath, solemnly excommunicated the monarch, and anathematized the place. The far-reaching consequences of this awful exercise of spiritual power are traceable for a thousand years through Irish history. No king, after Dermid, resided permanently upon the hill of Tara. Other royal houses there were in Meath, at Taltine, at the hill of Usna, and on the margin of the beautiful Loch Ennel, near the present Castle Pollard, and at one or other of these, after monarchs held occasional court but those of the northern race made their habitual home in their own patrimony near Armagh, or on the celebrated hill of Aliach. The date of the malediction which left Tara desolate is the year of our Lord 554. The end of this self-willed, semi-pagan, 
Dermid, was in unison with his life. He was slain in battle by Black Hugh, Prince of Ulster, two years after the desolation of Tara. Four kings, all fierce competitors for the succession, reigned and fell within ten years of the death of Dermid. And then we come to the really interesting and important reign of Hugh the Second, which lasted twenty-seven years, A.D. 566 to 593, and was marked by the establishment of the independence of the Scoto-Irish colony in North Britain, and by other noteworthy events. But these twenty-seven years deserve a chapter to themselves. End of chapter 4